Thank you everyone for coming out today. I, I appreciate the turnout. Wendy warned me that it was a full house and it, it really is. It's, it's wonderful to see that there's so much interest in, um, in research in dementia. And uh, what I'm going to be focusing on today are three or four areas actually. Uh, I'll be talking a little bit about uh, treatment. Uh, what do we know about current treatment and what's on the horizon? I'll also be touching on diagnosis because this is pretty key. How are we diagnosing dementia and are there opportunities for more accurate and uh, potentially cost-effective diagnosis? Uh, the third area will be on risk reduction. What can you personally do to reduce your risk of developing dementia to try and prevent it? Uh, and the fourth most important piece, actually, and a key component of the research that we fund at the Alzheimer's Society, is how do you live well with dementia? Once you have a diagnosis, what do you do? So, before we move on, uh, a show of hands, how many of you uh, know how, a dementia, how dementia is diagnosed? If you were to go into a clinician's office, do you know what to expect? Show of hands. Okay, a handful. Um, thank you, that's helpful. Uh, so, one of the tools that a clinician will use is a cognitive test. Uh, they will do a battery of other uh, tests as well, mainly to eliminate that whatever your memory complaints are are not related to dementia. And then they will do this test. And that test will include a couple of words that you'll be asked to read and remember for recall later. So. Please take note of those three words because we're coming back to those later. We've got red, face, and daisy. Um, but what is dementia? Dementia is actually an umbrella term and it really encompasses a host of diseases. It's not a term for one disease. Alzheimer's disease is the most common, but there are several other uh, diseases that are a part of dementia. So Lewy body dementia, vascular dementia, frontal temporal dementia, and all of these dementias can have different tra trajectories in their progression. And the most important thing to keep in mind is that dementia is not a normal part of aging. It's, it is normal to have some memory complaints, to forget things, lapses in words here and there, maybe forget where your keys are, where you parked your car, which happens to me all the time. But that's, that's part of, uh, that's a normal memory lapse. Dementia is different. And the key piece is while there is memory loss and it's significant memory loss, there are other types of warning signs to look for. So for example, changes in mood and behavior, uh, potential changes in personality, uh, significant language problems for a person who may be very verbal, who's suddenly forgetting commonplace words or, or tasks that they were very familiar with. And uh, there's more information on this on the Alzheimer's Society's website if you wanted more of those resources. <coughs> but what is the main risk factor for dementia? It's aging. And as you see here in this graph, our population globally is aging. Um, as the years go by, you'll see it goes up to 2050. And you'll see more and more countries popping up where the countries are getting dark blue. And what that dark blue indicates is that 30% or more of the population in that country is over the age of 60. And that's the strongest risk factor for dementia, and Canada is one of those aging populations. What does that mean, and how does that translate into, uh, into care and, and dementia within Canada? So currently, there are over half a million Canadians living with dementia. And to, to give you a sense of context, that's it's like having half of Winnipeg currently living with dementia. And that number is expected to double in less than 15 years. Dementia also affects women more than men. Um, and the cause for that, we still don't know. There is research ongoing. And the way that dementia affects women is, is, is twofold. There's, it affects women in terms of developing the disease but women are often also the caregivers for people living with dementia. So there's, um, there's a couple of different ways in which it touches women. Lastly, the economic cost of dementia. It's estimated in 2011 that the cost of dementia in Canada would be 33 billion, and that number is expected to go up to 293 billion, almost 300 billion in 2040. And that's 
primarily to the healthcare system, but really dementia touches us in many informal ways. So for example, uh, the daughter who quits her job to be able to stay home and take care of dad because he's developed dementia. That's an informal cost because she's no longer working. That's a salary that she's foregoing. And that's part of the informal cost that we need to consider and that we don't really. So let me talk a little bit about the hallmarks of dementia from a biological perspective. Uh, there are two key hallmarks. They're called plaques and tangles. Let me see if I can get this pointer working. So right here, you can see you can see that these are neurons. These are the, the cells in your brain, and these are the healthy ones. And, and if you look at the healthy ones, they've got lots of arms and tentacles going out. They're communicating with each other. And for a person who develops dementia, it starts dying off. Those arms are not connecting anymore. They're not, they're not communicating because the plaques, which is an accumulation of a protein called amyloid, um, starts clogging up. And there are also tangles, which are accumulation of a different protein called tau. And if you take a look at the brain of a healthy person versus a person who uh, died of advanced dementia, you can see that the brain cells have shrunk. And so the brain becomes smaller in volume, and there are more gaps and holes because that person has lost so much of their, of their cells. So what exists in terms of treatment? Well, for current treatment, there are two pathways. Uh, the first are called cholinesterase inhibitors. And what these do is they increase the amount of a neurotransmitter, which is something that helps cells communicate. <coughs> that neurotransmitter is called acetylcholine. And it increases the level of that so that there's better communication between the cells. The other type of treatment is called an NMDA receptor antagonist. And again, the same idea is to try and help the brain cells to communicate more, even when you have dementia. But here's the thing about these two treatments. They were last developed, the last breakthrough, breakthrough in treatment for dementia was 15 years ago. We have not had a breakthrough since then. And there's only a handful of drugs that we can currently use to treat dementia. Now, for some people, the drugs work very well. And for others, it doesn't. It has terrible side effects, and it's not very effective. So on average, uh, these, these therapies really only help slow the decline by about six months. So what's on the horizon? <clears throat> so this graph shows you uh, some of the major pharmaceutical companies that are currently developing or testing uh, therapeutics for dementia. But in total, this is 16 therapies. That's it. And this is as of September 2019. And actually since then, there have been a couple of withdrawals in, in therapies. What does that mean in terms of clinical trials? Uh, so if you, if you know about clinical trials, you know they tend to happen in three phases. Phase one is that early testing phase. Phase two is when it's starting to, uh, to be tested in a much broader way. And phase three is when you're much closer to it being implemented and, and being available to the general public. And so of those 16 drugs that you saw, half of them are in phase two. And often this is the stage where they don't cross over uh, to phase three. Right now we're at about just under a quarter of those drugs that are in phase three development. Um, but here's the thing about dementia uh, and, and clinical trials in, in general. We underfund dementia research. Um, even though it touches the lives of so many people, if you look at the difference between funding um, for cancer versus dementia or Alzheimer's, it's a significant difference. And that's reflected in the number of clinical trials that we have. Because if you don't fund the research, it can't translate into trials. Uh, here's some of the upcoming research that has the potential to be very uh, valuable for us. Um, this research study is led by a neurologist, um, Dr. Sandra Black, in Canada, actually, she's in Toronto. Uh, and what her research was doing was trying to find a way to open the blood-brain barrier. So the blood-brain barrier is it's a protective barrier around the brain and it separates the fluids in the brain from the rest of the body. And the reason for that is to protect the brain from potential, potential infections, viruses. It does its job very effectively. 
On the other hand, it's so effective that often drugs cannot cross over to the brain to have the kind of impact that we need it to have. Uh, and so researchers have been looking at safe ways to be able to cross that barrier and to be able to have the drugs cross over. And this is particularly important for dementia. So what Dr. Back's research um, uh, showed was that she was able to inject what are called microbubbles into your veins, which travel up to your brain. And then she uses ultrasound waves that temporarily shake those bubbles and open up the blood-brain barrier. And by doing that, it opens up a pathway for drugs to cross over. So what does this mean for us? Well, this trial was after almost two decades of testing the technology in mice. She's now been able to test it in humans, and she's looking to expand it to a much larger human trial. And if it is successful, it would mean that she can then start looking at testing some of the potential therapies coming down the pipe. Now, I talked a bit about the two main um, areas or hallmarks of dementia, the amyloid and tau. And a lot of research has gone into focusing on those as the potential cause of dementia. And it's not to say that those aren't, they are clearly involved. But now a lot of research is starting to look at what are the other options, what are the other hypotheses that might be impacting dementia. And this is looking at the idea that inflammation in the brain, which is linked to stress, is linked to dementia. So there have been multiple studies that have shown that there is a sustained inflammatory response in the brain. So it's like an immune response in the brain, and all of those immune cells are activated. And they've seen it very strongly in people living with dementia versus those without. And what they've also seen are there are correlation studies to show that there's a link between stress, which causes some of those brain matter changes, and, and the application of those immune cells. So what does that mean in terms of the research translating across? Well, inflammation may have chronic effects on the brain structure and cognition. So it means that that level of inflammation is probably or could be linked to dementia. And it could mean, therefore, that in types of, types of therapies, that anti-inflammatory medication could be an option for treatment of dementia. And it's one that we haven't considered previously. There is more research that needs to be done, but there is ongoing research looking at whether reducing your stress, particularly in midlife, can that reduce the risk of developing dementia later on. Um, <clears throat> another study that's been very interesting in terms of treating dementia, and this is not in terms of um, uh, treating necessarily the cognitive decline, but the symptoms of dementia, is the use of uh, cannabinoid. Um, so, we're all familiar with marijuana. I don't know how many of you have, have smoked up recently, considering that it is now legal in Canada. But it is used um, for the treatment of uh, symptoms of chemotherapy, for example, in Canada, so it does have a medical use. Uh, and um, this researcher was looking at the potential benefits of um, a specific synthetic called nabilone in being able to reduce some of the behavioral effects of dementia. Uh, because as dementia progresses, uh, people tend to become agitated, uh, they can become very angry, there are a lot of behavioral responses, um, and also lose their appetite, their weight gain drops, uh, which of course has other impacts. Uh, and so what she did was she ran a 14-week clinical trial on 39 participants who received Navalone for uh, six weeks. And it produced some very interesting results. She found that it reduced and actually improved um, agitation. It improved overall behavior. Um, but there are some potential issues to consider and risks to consider. For example, you have to monitor the risk of sedation when you are taking, even though it's a synthetic. And she needs to run a larger clinical trial to be able to understand the effectiveness of that alone in, in a larger cohort of people living with dementia. But this study is much closer to being implemented in the public and therefore having, um, having these kinds of synthetics available um, for, for the treatment of these behavioral changes. I'm now going to get into the second half, which is around diagnosis. Uh, so we talked about the ways in which you can get diagnosed for dementia when you go into a clinic. 
Uh, but most of it is still by the process of elimination. But there have been some very interesting research on the horizon in terms of finding more cost-effective and um, easy to use um, uh, diagnostic tools. And one of them has been blood biomarkers. So <clears throat> biomarkers are essentially uh, molecules that are in your blood that can be early indicators of the disease, in this case of dementia, or of um, uh, the risk of dementia. So there are two different things. The, when I talk about identifying the disease, that's called a diagnostic biomarker. And uh, there's been a lot of research looking at trying to measure, for example, amyloid and tau, those hallmarks that I talked about. They are molecules that are also produced in your uh, blood. And looking at those signatures and being able to identify if someone actually does have dementia by taking a blood sample. The other type of biomarker is more of a predictive one. Uh, and there's been an interesting study that recently got released looking at plasma clustering. And uh, what it showed in the study, is, is this, the researcher looked at oh, 1,500 participants and found that there was an age-dependent association with the increased risk of dementia. But I want to point something out here. These are association studies. They're not causal studies. And this is the thing about research. Associations mean that it looks like there's a link, uh, but we don't know that this necess X causes Y. In order to have those kinds of causal studies, the goal of the is <coughs> clinical trials, and this is often very expensive and what the, and, and what the cause of the holdup is. <coughs> but in terms of the blood biomarkers, they are at a very early stage, but there are ongoing studies for cross-validation. And if the cross-validation is successful in showing <coughs> if you can take a blood sample and be able to diagnose someone with dementia, or take a blood sample and identify that they're at risk of dementia, this would be a significant game changer at the clinical level when you go into your uh, doctor's office because they're non-invasive and they're cost-effective and they can be done <coughs> upfront just as when you would do a blood test for any other uh, screening that your physician would be doing. A second type of really interesting research around diagnostics is on eye testing. Uh, so there are two types of eye testing uh, uh, research studies that are, or hypotheses that are currently being looked at. The one is around blood flow and memory. So these researchers used a type of method called optical coherence, tomographic angiography. And what they did, what that basically did, was look at the blood flow in your eye, in your retina. And they looked at the density of blood vessels in your eyes. And what they found was that people who had thinner retinas and less blood flow, fewer blood vessels, were more likely to be associated with memory impairment, so potentially developing dementia. Again, this, was an, this, this and a couple of others were association studies, uh, but there's more work on going to see whether you could use an eye test this way then to be able to, uh, to, to predict that someone has dementia. The other type of eye test is looking at eye movement. So instead of the blood flow, uh, these researchers are looking at the, whether the way your eyes move when you're focusing on a certain object is predictive of potentially developing dementia. And they've got some very interesting results. And this is very even more valuable because they are predicting that if these eye movements can demonstrate that you have a risk of dementia, it would do it before you even develop the symptom. So having this available, again, would mean it's a very non-invasive test. You, you go in as you would go into your opt opt optometrist, and they would do the eye test. Um, <clears throat> but unfortunately, these are still correlation studies, and there's more work that needs to be done to be able to make it available for diagnosing. OK. So now I'm getting into the third area of research, which I think is probably why most of you are here, which is what can you do about reducing your risk of dementia? This is a very interesting quote that came up from a researcher who's in Canada, actually. And she said that up to 50% of the cases of Alzheimer's disease may be the result of diet and lifestyle. And that means we have the real opportunity to lower the burden of dementia in the Canadian population by improving our diet, exercise, and lifestyle. So how does that translate? 
Well, to begin with, the recommendation, and this is recommendations that are available from the World Health Organization, from American associations and Canadian associations, that if you want to reduce your risk of dementia, first you should start by treating any existing conditions. So reduce your risk of stroke, because if you are at risk of stroke, you are also at higher risk of developing vascular dementia. You want to be able to work to manage diabetes. You want to treat depression and hearing loss. These are all things that your physician would tell you about. But here's where the research gets very interesting. So most of you might have heard, what's good for your heart is good for your head. And that translates in the research. And while that doesn't sound like it's particularly interesting, because who wants to really change their diet? It is very important. The risk is very strong. And these factors have been shown to really significantly lower your risk of dementia, even if you implement it later in life. Uh, so this researcher studied adults who were 50 years and older, who shifted their diet from whatever diet they had to the recommended plan. And you can see the recommended plan here on the right, which was to reduce their intake of red meat, prepackaged foods, and sweet pop. Not to eliminate, but to reduce. Um, and then to increase uh, their intake of fish, whole grains, leafy vegetables, all the things that you know is, is good for your heart as well. And what, that, what they found through that study was that after four months of changing their diet, these adults performed as if they were nine years younger on their tests of reading and writing speed. They also did not experience any memory loss four years later. What does this mean? There's a significant link between diet and dementia. Uh, and uh, all of these guides are available on our website if you're interested. Uh, but essentially, what it's telling you to follow is a Mediterranean diet, a healthy diet. Uh, what are some of the other factors to consider? Well, exercise. Again, good for your heart, also good for your brain. There have been a lot of research re recently that has shown that exercise significantly reduces your risk of dementia. It means moderate. It does mean that you have to maybe go to the gym. You might have to work up a sweat. Uh, but doing that consistently a couple of times a week can reduce your risk of dementia. Sleep is another very interesting factor. The risk relationship is fairly new. Uh, but what the research is showing is that if you increase your um, amount of sleep, to at least seven hours, you reduce your risk of dementia. Social engagement and cognitive stimulation are two other areas, and I'll come to that in a minute. But first, what were those three words? Oh, you guys are pretty good. OK, we're paying attention. Thank you. All right. Why does it matter that you should do any of these pieces? Why should you try to change your lifestyle? And why should you do it now? What if it's too late? Uh, so this is some uh, fairly new research that has come out that talks about something called brain reserve or cognitive resilience. Uh, so what it shows is that there are a couple of different factors that impact your risk and, and your potential for developing dementia. One of it is genes, but it's a very small percentage. Five to 10% of people uh, have a genetic component that would put them at risk of developing dementia. Uh, there are potential other components. ApoE4 is another one. It's a genetic variant. It means you're at higher risk. It doesn't mean you will absolutely develop dementia. Uh, but there are also environmental factors, which we talked about, but some of the others are pollution. Uh, for example, living closer to a highway, studies have shown, can moderately increase your risk of dementia. You can't control those pieces unless you're willing to move. You can't do it in Toronto, it's far too expensive. Maybe you can pull that off in the of head. But there are other environmental factors. For example, your level of education, which you can't go, go back and change. But some of those lifestyle factors are even more strongly linked to dementia, and those are things that are in your control. So diet, exercising, sleep, what those do as you engage and you change your lifestyle is they, do, they build what's called cognitive reserve. Now you build it from childhood and you can continue to build it into your older age as well. It doesn't stop just at a certain midpoint. It's not like menopause or anything like that, it continues. 
and you can continue to build that cognitive reserve. So that what happens is, is that either, if you are at risk of developing dementia, it slows the progression because the disease has to fight harder to be able to impact your brain. And that's a very important frame shift if you think about it. Because most people, when they think about a diagnosis of dementia, it's a death sentence. They think of it as, oh, that's it, I'm done. I kind of have to go home and put my affairs in order. And that's absolutely not the case. If you get a timely diagnosis of dementia, some people can live 10, 20 years with dementia. So how do you live well when you have that kind of a diagnosis? And that gets me into the next segment um, of the presentation, which is how do you live well with dementia? And, and a lot of the work that the Alzheimer's Society does, is, as Wendy, I'm sure, will talk about later on. So the research has been uh, fairly active in this area as well. One of the key pieces has been around group cognitive stimulation therapy and exercise. Both of these areas have shown that if people living with dementia engage in a range of activities, from general stimulation, for concentration and thinking, usually in a social environment, that they can uh, slow the decline and that it improves their quality of life, it improves their memory and their thinking scores. Uh, so one example of that is a program that's offered here at the Alzheimer's Society of Manitoba called Minds in Motion, which combines exercise and social engagement. So it's a double whammy in terms of reducing your risk. Another area of emerging research is in music and social engagement. I think anecdotally we've heard that music can be good in helping cope with dementia. Uh, but the research hasn't caught up with it yet. And this is one of the, um, uh, one of the research uh, programs that's currently running in uh, UVic uh, in BC. And what this researcher is doing is something called an intergenerational choir. So she's bringing together people living with dementia, uh, high school students who meet weekly and they learn new pieces of music, they sing together. And she studies their cognitive ability, their social engagement, and their physical activity over a period of time. I think it's been going on for three or four years now. And the results are very promising in showing uh, that this kind of engagement really helps reduce, um, uh, slow down the cognitive decline. I'd like to touch a little bit on what the Alzheimer's Society does and what the Alzheimer's Society Research Program is about. ASRP, as we call it, runs an annual competition. And we invest in a couple of key areas. We invest in biomedical research, so some of the, the basic research I talked about around cure and treatment. But we also invest in quality of life research, so the research around how you live well when you are living with dementia. Um, but we also focus in on young investigators. These are the researchers who are just starting their careers, who are just getting into the field of dementia, and are having a hard time accessing the money to help them to build their research programs because dementia research is so underfunded. Uh, and so the Alzheimer's Society invests and uh, funds young investigators so that they can get their research programs up and running. And this year we have four areas of priority. Uh, discovery research, which is the, the basic treatment research, policy and health system change, uh, evaluation of community programs, so programs like Minds in Motion, and then ethical and legal issues related to living with dementia. We also engage citizen reviewers. So these are people who are living with dementia who are part of our program. So as I mentioned, um, we, we have people living with dementia and people can live with dementia well if they get the right supports. And these are two of our citizen reviewers. So these are two gentlemen who both have dementia and have been living with it for about 8 to 10 years. Uh, and they participate on our peer review panel. So they review all the research proposals that come in and they comment on them, they score uh, along with the experts who are working with them. And here's what both of them had to say. So Roger Markle is, uh, lives in Alberta, and he said, I'm a big believer that research equals progress. If we're going to realize meaningful advancements towards living with dementia, it will be done through research. And Jim Mann, who lives in uh, BC, he said that participating in the peer review panel was a fabulous experience. 
to hear the commitment in the researchers' voices when they discuss each of the applications and the depth of knowledge each researcher has. Uh, so if you're interested, please reach out to me because we always have an opening and we're looking to expand this role. Uh, through the Alzheimer's Society, we also have something called a research portal. And basically, it's an opportunity to participate in research. So if you're interested in joining a clinical trial or finding out about some of the research studies that I spoke about where they're recruiting participants, you can come to our portal, which is on the alzheimer.ca website, and you'll be able to see a listing of all of the studies. You'll be able to contact the researchers and, and be a part of the, um, a part of the study. <clears throat> We fund uh, approximately about $2 million worth of research in dementia annually, but we receive 104 studies that are eligible for research, which translates to about $12 million of research that goes unfunded. So we're really working to try and close that gap to be able to fund research at the level that it needs to be funded to have the impact on people living with dementia and their caregivers. One of the ways that we've been doing that is through something called the CCNA. Uh, it's the Canadian Consortium on Neurodegeneration and Aging. It's a network of over 400 researchers from across Canada, all doing work in dementia and in different areas of dementia. And they work together. They combine their data, they share their data, they network with each other. Uh, and it's one of the few models that exists in the world to be able to achieve this. And the Alzheimer's Society has been one of the lead founders of that. Another uh, platform that might be of interest to you, uh, and uh, Ben touched on it earlier, is the Global Dementia Observatory. What this observatory does is it collects data from across the world, all the different countries, and looks at what they're doing in a variety of things, dementia research, their dementia policy, how are they supporting long-term care, what are they doing to reduce your risk of dementia, and all of that data is available online. You can download it, and you can look at it, and you can see um, the progress that countries are making. I'll end on this slide. I know I've talked quite significantly about the, under, the lack of funding, uh, but really when you compare it even within the US that has funded fund, um, research significantly, you'll see that in, um, in Alzheimer's, about 500 million was being allocated or planned to be spent on dementia compared to almost all the other diseases which are in the millions. So we've got a long way to go to be able to support the kind of dementia research that we need to have the impact it does. Thank you very much for listening and um, I'll open it up for Q&A. I really have any connection with uh, dementia? This, sorry, I didn't quite hear the question. Thyroid or Oh. <clears throat> I, I don't know that area of research very well. Maybe Ben, you can comment on it? Well, actually, one of the things we look at in our lab is brain metabolism, and, and the thyroid is responsible in part for regulating metabolism. So I would say indirectly, yes. I don't study the thyroid, but uh, there's a connection there. Next question. Good. Put hands up. Yeah. So the gentleman asked about thyroid. Yes, he did. One of the things that causes Alzheimer's is uh, when your um, uh, hormones are out of balance. I mean, that's a study that's been done in the state. Yeah, it's one of the pathways that has been studied, for sure. And though they have a certain date in the United States, I mean, they're reversing Alzheimer's in the States. Okay, mm we might need to chat about that a bit later. No, no. Okay. Dr. Dale Renson, he wrote a book, interesting. Uh, the end, the end of Alzheimer's. Dr. Right. Daniel Amen wrote another book, Memory Rescue. Both of these guys are great doctors. And they, sh uh, they show we're talking about amyloids. Well, okay, you're talking about inflammation. Inflammation is one of the things that causes Alzheimer's. Yeah, so um, I do know the book that you're talking about. It's called the Bredesen Protocol. That's right. That's what you're talking, referring to, yeah. 
Um, and so what he's referring to is built on a lot of the evidence that yes, I talked about. Yes, You're absolutely you. right. Yes. Um, however, I'd argue that he hasn't necessarily shown the evidence that it reverses Alzheimer's. Well, he has shown his own papers on it. Right. But the, the great thing about research is yes. that you can write papers and you can publish them and it gets validated through other researchers as well. So I'm looking forward to hearing what other researchers have to say and, and cross-validating uh, the results of the studies. It'd be very interesting. So in other words, right now we're not believing you. <laughs> I, it's not my, it's not it's my not area, good. so I won't be writing a paper on it if that makes you feel any better. No, 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 I appreciate that. As far but as I know, it's, it's an end of one. Yeah. There's one, no, there's two, Dr. Daniel Lehman is the second one. No, what he means is the studies are based yeah, on one person. About, yeah, small no, no, he's reversed over 100 people. In fact, he's teaching doctors on his protocols across the United States and abroad. Thank you for that comment, I appreciate it. Hello. Um, I wondered if you could um, explain the difference between hereditary dementias and non-hereditary dementias. I'm wondering if early onset Alzheimer's is always hereditary. That's a great question. Thank you for bringing it up. Um, so yes, as I mentioned, about five to ten percent of dementia is hereditary. Uh, and yes, it generally tends to be early onset if you are inheriting it. And it's related to two genes right now that we know of, APP and PS, presenilin. Uh, and uh, if you have those two genes, then yes, the likelihood of developing dementia is much higher. You likely will inherit it. But um, the majority of dementias appear to be non-inherited. And that we have, we're not seeing a genetic language yet. In terms of treatment, I've read about some things like the butterfly program, the eating alternative. What is your opinion of that sort of thing? Uh, so both of those models are excellent models. Um, they're mainly used in long-term care. And what they are are not so much treatment models in the sense that it's not about curing dementia, it's about caring for dementia. Uh, and, and you're right, they're based on something called um, the person-centered philosophy. So the idea is, is that when someone has dementia, uh, we tend to just see the symptoms and we react to that, and that it's really about trying to understand the person, who they are, and why they may be expressing themselves the way that they do. Uh, so the butterfly model and the Eaton alternative both uh, were in the uh, developed in the states, and so uh, Ben, you might have some comments on that as well. Uh, but uh, what they do is they change the way you give, you provide care in long-term care. Right now, most of our long-term care is based on a very uh, hospital-like clinical model, and what the butterfly model and the Eaton model do is try to change the way that um, the staff interact with a person living with dementia and the way that they provide that care. Uh, they're both excellent models that uh, more research is being done on and, and they're being adopted uh, more widely. I know the butterfly model has been adopted in a couple of long-term care homes here, as has the an alternative model. A few years ago, there was uh, some research started in Colombia a number of families there that were uh, getting Alzheimer's and they were dying at age 50. So a bunch of scientists got together. Is there anything further on that research? Uh, yes, there have been. Uh, and it's been published. I'd be happy to share the, the results with you. Um, but that is the inherited dementia that we were talking about. What they found were those Colombian families inherited a certain variant of that gene uh, that basically meant that they developed dementia very early in their 50s, some even in their 40s from what I remember. Uh, and the progression was very rapid. Hi. Um, I'm interested in the intersectionality between different uh, uh, spheres of, uh, that influence the ability for people to get exercise in order to um, treat disease. And my, um, my 
Graham Clark has dementia, lives in a golf course community in a suburb of Calgary, and he has a hard time getting out of the house or having that ground to leave because the fast moving traffic, he, he, he can't go get to the post anymore. Um, and um, we're, we're hosting a section uh, a session next uh, week about dimension of the built environment. My question for you, um, during mode shift, my question for you is, is there a pattern in um, walkable, bikeable communities throughout the world and the um, onset of development? And do you have any messages for traffic engineers or, or politicians on, 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 on the city itself as a, as a, as a, as a solution to um, exercise? Uh, thanks for that question. So um, what you're referring to is something that's called dementia-friendly communities. Um, and it's an area that uh, I know Wendy is also engaging in at the Alzheimer's Society of Manitoba. And basically what it means is thinking about a, a society or a community more holistically. How do we make it friendly? How do we support people to live in that community? So it could mean something like um, a certain type of crosswalk so that your grandfather could cross the road to get to the golf course. It could mean that uh, when you go sh grocery shopping, that the clerk has training to recognize that someone has maybe a dementia and needs a little more support or time. Uh, so there are, are different ways that that can be done. Um, it's been implemented in about 14 or 15 different countries. Canada is one of the countries that signed on as wanting to support dementia-friendly communities more broadly. And the Government of Canada is currently funding community studies that are focused on dementia-friendly communities so that they can have a broader scope. I was wondering if there's any correlation that we know of uh, to substance abuse and dementia. Well, I think it goes back to uh, what was mentioned earlier about inflammation. Uh, I, I, I can see a connection there. I'm not an expert in drug abuse or drugs of abuse, um, but any lifestyle factor, stress, a prolonged history of, of particular drugs, if it increases inflammatory responses, you're going to be at a higher risk for uh, dementia and other, other diseases as well. So I can see it from that perspective, but I can't give you any direct studies off the top of my head. So there are a couple of studies um, in terms of substance abuse, actually more around alcohol abuse, because that there have been some very direct links. Um, and in fact, one of the first things that um, will happen if you go in for a diagnosis is uh, your physician will probably screen for those if they, they know uh, that you might have been abusing alcohol or any other uh, symptoms like that, because sometimes it's reversible. Sometimes just stopping the alcohol use, depending on how long it's been used for, can reverse the symptoms of dementia. Maybe Dr. Sitar has a comment on this, drugs of abuse. Um, the people, older people who use sorry, alcohol. Let's get a mic. Sorry. sorry let's, can we get Anna a mic? Older people who abuse alcohol oftentimes have dietary deficiencies, often, uh, often involving the B vitamins that affect their blood and also their mentation. And oftentimes getting them on a healthy diet will cause that reversible component you're talking about. And so that's part of the difficulty of determining uh, irreversible, dementia, irreversible dementia from nutrient uh, deficient um, inhibition of brain function. And, and while I'm on it, on the behavioral aspect, you commented about part of the problem with behavioral uh, issues is inadequate pain management uh, in uh, institutionalized elderly. And oftentimes, if that's done well with non-opioid analgesics, you will not have to go to the psychiatric drugs because the patient has no way of telling you that you're hurting them. Uh, and they oftentimes are not handled well. Um, and uh, so pain management is an important, easy, cheap a way to um, try something that may be less dangerous than the antipsychotic drugs. And also goes back, I think, to the previous question about the Eden Alternative and the Butterfly Model, because both of those models also try to understand the communication of the person, to not see it as just a behavioral symptom, but as a way that the person might be communicating pain or communicating that they're uncomfortable in some way.
educator and watching people grow and develop and then stop developing because they get to a certain age and they say, well, life is going to happen. And so there's pretty nothing I can do about it. But we have thousands of people now living in assisted living places or which is a type of community whereby people as a group could become increasingly, increasingly active in terms of exercise, the diet is, is a possibility, and social interaction is definitely a possibility, but they, they stay off to the side and they don't get engaged because you know, there's nothing I can do about it. If it's going to happen, it's going to happen. What kinds of things is Alzheimer's decided doing or think of doing to get people off their butts and start doing things that are really be useful for them in terms of their own longevity and wellness. So I think Wendy can comment more on the programs and services in Manitoba, but I do know that we do, as a society, offer a lot of programs to try and get people engaged, to get them even out of their homes, to come to the society, to rec centers, to community centers, so that they can participate in these kinds of programs. Because that engagement, the peer-to-peer, just there's nothing to replace being able to speak to another person who understands what you're going through. Uh, and, and that's part of the supports. But Wendy, do you want to comment on it further? Well, I think it actually adds a couple of different things. We talked about dementia-friendly communities, right? We talked about just kind of municipal policies that made a difference on how to help somebody cross the street or transportation to enable somebody to participate and go to the rec center when they're having a, you know, maybe a little bit more difficulty in doing that. We talk about, you know, building dementia-friendly communities where some of these community centers maybe understand more about dementia and make people feel welcome and facilitate their participation um, rather than somebody feel embarrassed because they make mistakes. And so all of those things are absolutely fundamental. I mean, we have particular challenges in Manitoba where we have sidewalks that are dangerous and hard to cross. We have a handy transit system that is difficult to go to if you're going to something for recreation purposes. And, and yet we know it's so fundamental for your health. I think we have to think about dementia in some ways the way we think about disability, where we think about people with disability when we used to talk about it, we, used to, we wouldn't talk about human rights. Where it's a different time now. People with disability have human rights. They're rights like everybody else, and so things are accessible for them. But we have to start talking about that with people with dementia. I mean, people have human rights. They have rights to be able to participate in their world, and they have rights to have their environment accessible to them. And dementia-friendly communities are part of that. And so we in order to, keep, to continue to participate in the world, and to be as healthy as they can and to function at their best um, as a community, as a society, we have to stand up and ensure that these environments and these spaces and the people around them are dementia friendly. Other questions? One here. Yeah. Um, when you uh, are speaking about dementia friendly communities, uh, I also think uh, we need to look into long term care. What are we doing with our dementia people in long-term care that are being sedated to the max so that they are easier to handle? And other provinces are holding back and stopping the sedation of our elderly that leave them like little vegetables in wheelchairs because we don't have the funding for these people to be cared for properly in our care homes. Um, and I'm asking the Alzheimer's Society and research, what are we doing in Manitoba to protect our elderly from being sedated where the family has no um, rights to refuse the sedation on their family member? And I think this is wrong. And we talk about human rights of people with dementia. It is terrible what I've seen in our province. Uh, thank you for that comment, and, and I would agree, I and mean, that kind of treatment is, is absolutely not something that we want to see for our loved ones. Um, from a research perspective, I can tell you that uh, there is a whole area of research called health service research that looks at how 
um, people living with dementia are treated in long-term care homes and looking at the rates of antipsychotic use, which you're talking about. And there are quite a few policies in place now to try and first measure what the existing level is and then to, to reduce it. Um, I know in BC and Ontario that's the case. Manitoba, uh, Wendy, maybe you can uh, comment on it a bit more. But it's, it's also a very complex system because exactly as you mentioned, there's also the staffing ratios. We need to be able to fund and staff appropriately to provide the kind of care that we're looking for as, as well. Um, so I absolutely take your point about it. Thank you for raising it. I've noticed in nursing homes that there's lots of sugary snacks and juice and desserts all the time. Is that making things worse? <coughs> That's a great question. Um, I'm, I don't know what the research is on, on the diet in long-term care. Uh, there are some studies that are looking at how you can change the diet. I, mean, I, would, I would assume, given what we know with existing research, that changing the diet and making it healthier would likely have an impact. But at the same time, it's a fine balance, right? You also don't want to take away some of the simple pleasures of the foods that you have that people would enjoy. So you kind of need to balance that. I also read Dr. Brendan's book, um, and I thought he had some real valid critiques of our current system in terms of looking at how we can diagnose people, really on a, a lot of very surface kind of tests and saying, hmm, that's what you have or that we have had very often within the community. Um, he also, uh, I mean, I think he did refer to a person or two that he said came back, um, but his protocol is so stringent, it would be such a, a horrific thing, I think, for most people to be able to uh, stay to religiously. However, one thing he talked about that I thought was very encouraging um, and promising is he used a metaphor of holes in the roof and talked about a number of the corollaries of um, Alzheimer's and looked at whether it was um, uh, nutrients that you were taking and the, the gentleman who mentioned your, your B vitamins, whether it was inflammation from sugar or chemicals, all the things that we say about diet and exercise, of course, but really looking at fine-tuning a lot of those things and saying um, we need to do a better job of making people more aware of all the possibilities so that we're making decisions for our lives. And so we're also not just saying, well, let's give people sweets in the rest home. I know, I know that's not what you're saying. But I think that that often happens instead of giving people tools to make a lot of good decisions. And, um, and, and hearing about it, like hearing tonight, maybe even, you know, you can think about this, or you can think about this, or there's something being shown up in this particular area. Um, I just think that we're out there. And while it was kind of a daunting book, it was an encouraging book because it looked at possibilities. It's a disease we know so little about. And um, you know, the, his references were pretty darn good in, in terms of some of the very um, well thought of people who were paying attention to his research. So no, I, 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 I think we agree I, with you. Um, and that's what I'm saying. A lot of his work is based on a lot of what I've presented around those lifestyle changes, around changing your diet, exercising, but in a much more micro way. He, he assigns a specific protocol to it, that he, he, he calls it the Bryson Protocol. But ultimately, it's about giving you the tools and the education mm -hmm. to make those decisions and lifestyle changes, and that it's never too late, that it's not, oh, I've developed dementia, now I can't do anything about it, or I'm a little older and therefore I can't do anything it. You can make those changes yes. and still reduce the risk. Of the yes, and he also talks about the difference from one person to another, and we don't know which one of those holes, you know, might um, impact you. But if we can kind of fill all of them up the best we can, in a way, and still have our life be the way we're going to live our life, um, we could probably be making more of those. Anyway. Oh, you. You mentioned exercise is good for the brain. I wonder if we could expand that. I just asked a question. How many people here know that when you exercise, your brain produces new neurons? Put up your hand. Okay. So I think if we can expand with exercise, what it actually does for your brain, how it does it, BDNF, etc. Just a thought. 
Uh, thank you for that. That might be a topic for a future talk. <laughs> um, because what I'm touching on is research where there are more explicit guidelines, where we can say we know exercise makes a difference. Yes, it can improve your cognition. It can uh, you know, improve your quality of life. Uh, but the individual research studies I didn't touch on. Um, there's a lot of it. Um, exercise in particular is an area that uh, there's a lot being done on it. Um, different populations, people living with dementia, people not, people at risk. And so there are different types of measures. What's the intensity? Should you work out 30 minutes a day, three times a week? Should you do yoga but not go golfing? Um, those kinds of pieces we don't have. I could just add one thing. So, you know, there's a big study in the United Kingdom on exercise and the aging. And one of the things they found is if you don't get started early in life, that if you wait too long, that the benefit isn't there. And they found that in a very large population in England. So exercise has many benefits for the heart, but for the brain, there was a window of opportunity that you could miss if you don't get started sooner than later. And that was one of the findings. Doesn't exercise produce BDNF? Yes. Don't you not need BDNF up here? Yes. So if I'm old, if I walk 30 minutes a day, well, I, I agree with you totally. It's just that it's just not that simple. Uh, and, and so the benefits are there. Um, but I, I think that some people, if they don't get started sooner than later, they're not going to show as a dramatic effect as others. I did. Uh, this also goes under the list of like something I read. Uh, <laughs> uh, there was a, uh, and this is making the rounds now, is that there's a uh, vaccine that is that uh, might be in development for uh, Alzheimer's dementia. Is there any validity to that? Uh, uh, any promise? And or is that one of those like, five to ten years, which is really in twenty to thirty? Years? I'm sorry to break it to you, but it is more of a 20-year kind of roadmap. Um, the vaccine, I think the one that you're talking about, um, it, the, it hit the news a couple of months ago, I think. Um, but it was not being tested in humans, it was being tested in mice models. And the problem that we've, we've run into consistently is you can test in a mouse, it, it might get rid of the amyloid plaques, their memory seems to improve, and then when you translate it over to the human body, it does a completely different thing. Or not completely different, but it doesn't necessarily translate the same way as it does in a mouse model. Uh, so with the vaccine, that's the case. Is there a different one that you might know of then? I think there's a lot in development right now, and I think it's a promising thing. In terms of talking about 10 or 20 years, I have no idea. Um, I really don't. But I, I think those are, you know, uh, interesting areas. In fact, the whole infectious disease hypothesis of Alzheimer's has a resurgence, especially after the last drug failure in the spring. People are paying more attention to it. Uh, it's complicated. Uh, so, you know, just stay tuned. You might be hearing more about infectious disease and Alzheimer's and, and vaccines as well.